Hello everyone, thanks for joining our webinar today. Um, throughout the presentation, if you can use the Q&A feature, which is on the right hand side to submit any questions, then Nick will do his best to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. Um, that's all I've got to say, so I'm going to um, hand you over to Nick. OK, thanks very much, Abby. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, yes, yeah, so Abby, Abby said my name is Nick Hunter and yeah, welcome to this webinar on delivering innovation. OK, so just to set the scene, um, just go through an introduction of, of what we aim to cover in this webinar. Um, I'd like to provide really an insight into how we develop products at Avon Protection. So a bit of a sneak peek behind the scenes, if you like, um, to see what goes on um, behind a lot of the products that are in the field. So we got a, we'll start with a, a, an overview of the product development um, team structure and uh, how we are structured globally. And then we'll specifically focus on our team in Melksham in the UK, where I'm based. And then we'll use the CH15, which is our latest um, product, and a CBRN air purifying escape respirator that was launched earlier last year. And uh, we'll, we'll really cover that, use that as a case study throughout um, the process. So just a little bit about me up front. Um, so I'm a senior design engineer at Avon Protection. I've worked for the company for over nine years now, and I've got a degree in industrial design and technology. So that was, I studied at, in uh, Loughborough University. And since graduating, I've, I've gained 14 years ex industry experience as a, in, in the field of product design and industrial design. Some of the products that I've worked on uh, during my time at Avon, so starting on the left, my first project, was the HMK 150, and this was the world's first helmet and mask respirator combination system designed to meet a German police standard. Then into the center, we got the um, MP and CS PAPA, and that was um, innovative for the time because it was the world's first flexible um, PAPA powered air purifying respirator. So it really kind of conformed to the body, was comfortable to wear, and uh, really reduces the breathing burden. Um, whilst you're wearing the equipment for long durations. And then on the far right, we've got the CH15, which is the most recent project product that I've worked on. And yeah, a very challenging one. It's um, been been quite a while in development, but it's um, now launched and, and very satisfying to get to that stage. So we'll be referring back to that one as a case study of some examples throughout how that's gone through our development process. But that's not everything we do. Um, Avon Protection, we've got a, a wide portfolio of products. So obviously well known and a long history in our full face respirators. Um, as I mentioned, powered air is, is something that's been in the last few years. And then we've we've used supplied air as well. So um, certain situations where you need that specialized equipment and we have respirators that can switch between supplied air and powered air and air purifying as well. So really covering the spectrum of, of use cases. And then we've got a, a specialist team based in Poole in the UK who work on our underwater systems. So very technical and uh, yeah, very de demanding and challenging products those, those to work on as well. And the ballistic protection is, is quite a new side, but it, it really kind of completes our product portfolio. So we've we've done some acquisitions over recent years to to get the helmets and the body armour um, into our product portfolio. So that's an exciting development that we're looking forward to integrating in the future. So just looking to set a bit of context geographically, as I mentioned, I'm based in Melksham in the UK and uh, we have sites in, in the States as well. So over in Cadillac in Michigan, we've got a, another factory and uh, office over there. Um, so as I should say, in, in Melksham, we also have a we have factory and office site. Um, and in Baltimore, we have, have a, an office site. So we've got um, our futures design team are based there as well. So we work very closely with the, the teams, um, the futures team in, in Baltimore and also the engineering teams in Cadillac. And then the the ballistic armor and helmets divisions um, come under the Team Wendy and also Avon Protection Ceradyne, 
and those are based in the, the United States as well. So to focus specifically on our team in the UK, um, our product development team consists of over 15 people. We've got varying backgrounds, so coming from product design, and industrial design, we've got mechanical engineers, um, computer aided design specialists, people who specialize in tooling and, and uh, how we manufacture our products, and then the electronics as well, which is, is quite a specialized skill. We work in a, a large open plan office, so we have great lines of communication to the other departments, so finance, operations, marketing, and uh, really it, that's definitely required to have that great kind of flow and um, open communication to get projects moving as we need to. And then being right next to the factory is a massive benefit. You can see your design coming to life in, in the factory. You can get hands on and, and really get the feedback from the production workers and see how you can kind of build that in to improve your designs for the future. We have uh, some great in-house uh, prototyping facilities. So we have a, a, a nice workshop with um, rapid prototyping facilities and traditional hand model making and and various things that we can just use to, to knock up prototypes very quickly and get that feedback and learning. And then we have an in-house test laboratory as well. So that's where we really put our products through their paces and we're trying to replicate um, what we have to go through for the independent certification in those circumstances. We also, a very important factor is the materials we use because our, our products go in very challenging environments, very demanding requirements on the materials. So we have an in-house um, materials development and characterization team who are based in the, the artist laboratory. So they do some great work in coming up with new formulations and testing on, on existing uh, ranges. And yeah, as, as I mentioned, we, we, we're constantly working uh, with our teams around uh, over in the United States. So lots of video conferences with, with those and uh, when travel permits, we, we go over and uh, see products come into life in their factories as well. So just up front, wanted to touch on the culture because this is, a I think, a, an important factor which can often be overlooked, but it it's, um, yeah, something having the right talent in the team is is hugely important. So we, we recognize this as a company. We have a, a graduate scheme which has run for um, several years now, and that's been very successful in, in, in bringing in new talent. Also specifically within the product development team, we have run um, a placement scheme for university students for several years. And again, this has been very successful because we've we've taken on full time people from from that scheme. Um, so this gives students a chance to come in and see how, how it works in industry um, and we learn a bit from them. So kind of fresh new ideas. So it's a, a real two way kind of share, but they go back to university for the final year with a lot more knowledge and how things work in the real world, which is some great, great experience and um, a great way for us to kind of see if that person's a good fit for, for our team. And then we also do work with local schools, so really promoting careers in design and technology, trying to inspire those young minds and also promote STEM. Um, so that's been a, a, a big push that some of our team and other departments have been involved in. But it's also important to have fun and um, build up that team spirit to, to, to work great together. So we take an event, uh, taken part in these extracurricular activities over the years. So the Tough Mudder was a, a, a great example. That was a 10 mile run that we did in 2018. Um, had a, a great team of, of employees that got together and it was a real kind of teamwork exercise. You had to help people kind of through this 10 mile obstacle course and quite severe obstacles at certain situations. So yeah, and then we finally kind of in, in, in 2019, we took part in the um, Red Bull Soapbox race. And we actually won that event, so that that was a fantastic experience. Um, yeah, get, getting to build something a bit a bit different and uh, get getting to appear on TV and just kind of take part in that event in front front of a huge crowd and uh, race down this very steep hill in Alexander Palace in London um, was was brilliant. And then spraying the champagne on the podium at the end was the real icing on the cake. So 
some great experience with, experiences we've had with the team and it's really helped kind of solidify that, that team spirit and working great as a team together. So just going through our process now, um, we use a, a stage gated process, which is very, fairly typical in product development. And we break that down into six stages. So starting with opportunities. Um, so that's really kind of gathering um, intelligence, looking where are the opportunities for new products. Then we're on stage two where we're generating ideas that, that really kind of satisfy those opportunities. Um, on to stage three, we've got to prove that there's a, a, a business case for that. So is, is it a customer? How, how much are they willing to buy? Is it worth the investment? That kind of thing. And then it's on to stage four where we have to prove um, the performance of the product. So can it work with the current technology we have? Um, can we manufacture it and, and will it work consistently to our required standards? And that, that follows on into the proof of quality. So as, you, as you're hitting the scale of manufacture, are you consistently producing quality items that will meet the, the necessary requirements? And once all that's done, which is yeah, uh, a massive amount of work, um, the launch is the final stage. Um, but that's a chance to to really kind of release the product to the customer and and then reflect on what went well and um, what can be improved on and cycle back. So we're kind of building that learning into future projects. And we'll kind of split that into three phases, uh, largely grouped as discovery, um, development and launch, as we'll refer to throughout this presentation. And through each stage, there's a, a decision point uh, meeting, so that's held with all the key project stakeholders and um, senior leaders from the, from the business. So really kind of put, um, put, out, put the cards on the table and see uh, how we're meeting, what we need to do at this stage to, to progress the project. Does it need to be stopped? Um, does, does resource need to be redirected? Um, and that kind of thing. So it's, it's really kind of keeping things honest. So you're not just progressing on blind. Um, you kind of referring back to, to the original intent and are, are we still on track to deliver? So we'll now go through the discovery phase. Um, and this is a very exciting kind of phase. We, we're doing a lot of kind of research here. Um, so this is getting kind of in depth, talking to the customers trying to become an expert in, an, in a, a field. So each product kind of has its unique um, requirements. So you're always kind of learning something new. So it's um, a great opportunity to kind of develop your skill set as well. Um, so we do things like immersive research where we really try and get into the, the shoes of the customer and experience how, how they use our equipment and see the pain points firsthand and what can be improved on. And then we work closely with customers on, on voice of the customer activities. So this can tend to be a bit further on when we've got physical prototypes to, to show and we want some feedback on how it's working so they can trial it with within their kind of operations and um, yeah, usual methods of working. And then competitor benchmarking is very important. So yeah, keeping an eye on, on what our competitors are doing. We are a, a world leader. so. We need to know um, where the strengths and weaknesses lie and how we can improve and adapt. So that's a, a, an important activity as well. So this discovery is, is happening during phases one to three of that, that um, stage gated process. And it, it's iterative, so it can kind of re, re, be reintroduced as, as new things are learnt as well. And we need to perhaps expand on knowledge. Just running through some of the examples over the years. So this was a, a great one at, um, we got to go down to Bovington Army Base in the UK and work with a the team there and, and get to go on the rifle range with our respirators and see how challenging it can be with various filters attached to, to sight a weapon and go in the CS gas chamber. So you really had to have faith that you'd fitted your mask correctly and uh, everything was working and got to take part in the, the time donning trials they do for their trainees as well. And it was all a, a CBRN awareness course, so chemical, uh, biological, radioactive and nuclear and working through the procedures that the, the army personnel use to stay protected in those challenging situations. 
um, onto Supplider here. So this was a, a research exercise where we visited FireSafe International and got to try on a whole host of different um, sets, breathing sets and equipment, um, see how those worked and and learn the basics of how you kind of use and maintain those and, and what, what the users have to go through to, to keep those products working. And then got to trial them in the confined space um, chamber they had in the back. So there's like a, a maze of um, tunnels that, that was set up in this warehouse. Uh, and that, that finished off in trying to rescue a, a nine stone mannequin, which was a dead weight down these real small passages and, and really kind of emphasized just how how difficult and challenging that can be when you're trying to squeeze through gaps with a, a large heavy object on your back and uh, dragging a dead weight. It, it was very challenging. You notice your breathing rate go up very quickly. Um, Army combat power demonstration was an event I attended in, in 2019 and this was a spectacular um, thing to witness really. It was set up very well. It's, like introducing you almost into a war zone. There's explosions, there's tanks, there's yeah aircraft and, and uh, things. And you get to go through the, the village that they've got up there. It's a deserted village they use for training operations and um, really kind of experience the, the capabilities they've got firsthand. And then there was chances to, to talk to the soldiers on various stations and, and get that knowledge of what what they use and how their capabilities are, are evolving. Here's a few examples of, of voice the customer studies where we've taken equipment and witnessed as as teams go through their exercises and put the equipment through the paces and then afterwards we kind of regroup and, and get gather feedback and see what what worked and what can be improved. And I mentioned the CH15, so bringing it back to that um, project, here's some examples of VOC activities that were took place early on in that uh, development. And they were really crucial to, to help um, steer the direction of the development. So addressing some, some um, challenges that came up in the practical use early on really helped to, us before we went too far down the line and 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 got to a point where you, you then test it and it, it doesn't work as as the user would expect. So huge learning opportunities and, and very important to do early on. We'll now look at concept design. So once we kind of um, identified the opportunities, we've got to kind of come up with those ideas. Um, and this is where you kind of get getting very creative. So it's a really exciting part of the process. We get together as a team, we do a lot of brainstorming, trying to pool ideas and, and use different people with different backgrounds and experiences um, to, to really help kind of generate as many ideas and, and different ideas as possible. And we start to we really rank those and decide what, what can be achieved and uh, really hone in on a, a final solution. We'll then use um, ideation and sketching to really kind of flesh out how, how that idea might take form. And then a series of design reviews throughout the process to, to kind of monitor, is, is it on track? Can we um, really manufacture this? Is it something that will, will work? And then this is all happening again through the discovery phase. Yeah, some examples here, so this is the ideation and sketching. So we kind of starting with traditional kind of analog sketching, putting pen to paper, but then we also use techniques where we do kind of digital uh, rendering. So some examples on, on screen of that as well. And back to the CH15, that was a, a great example where up front we put a, a lot of work into the, the packaging because this type of product, um, an escape respirator, is is something. Um, it, it's basically an insurance policy. You never really want to have to use it. It's a, a bad day if you do need it, but you want to always have it nearby if you you do need to access it. If there's a gas leak or a CBRN incident, um, if it's on hand, then great. You you're kind of ready to go. So the way we could kind of maximise that possibility was really making the packaging as small and uh, light and easy to carry as possible. So lots of work went in into that up front to, to really kind of 
hone in the form factor and work out different methods we could facilitate carrying for, for users as well. So it's likely it's always with them when they need it. So now look at prototyping, and this is where you're taking those ideas on paper and really bringing that into the physical form. So you can start to kind of test and evaluate and, and really see if it's um, looking like a viable solution. So again, a variety of um, techniques and methods at our disposal here, starting with very kind of rough and ready um, prototypes is, is, a, is a great way to start. There's lots you can learn from just jumping into the 3D space and, and modeling something up. And then we can move on into more refined detail where we can get 3D prints made up and we can do that in-house or if we need some more exotic materials, we can kind of outsource that. Um, so prototyping is really a kind of learning activity and, and it's about kind of, um, we kind of embrace failure at this stage. So um, you, you can learn a lot from your failures and, and kind of build that in and, and make improvements. So as long as you're always learning something, failure is never a bad thing at this stage. And it's, yeah, to fail often to succeed sooner is, is really the mantra. And um, this goes throughout the, the discovery and also into the development phase, you can kind of still be iterating and, and um, prototyping kind of new, um, new features or new parts. So some examples here um, of the CH15. So the rough and ready prototyping stage, it's amazing what you can do with um, some cardboard and sticky tape, but these models were hugely valuable just to determine the form factor and how we were going to fold the, the device and, and get it to that small and compact form to, to make it easy to carry. Um, but also checking that it, it works well on when a person dons it and, uh, and yeah, interfaces with the body well. Moving on into the, these are some examples of uh, 3D printed parts and um, yeah, kind of that more detailed um, kind of level of prototyping. We're also at this stage starting to test the performance of things so um, we can actually start to get measurements and um, get yeah quantifiable data around the parts. So into the detailed design phase, um, here we're really digging down into to the nitty gritty. How How is this thing going to work? Uh, we're really defining things into 3D CAD and we use SOLIDWORKS um, predominantly in our company and we have to prepare all that data so it's ready for manufacture really. Uh, we can run simulations at this stage so we can look at stresses and strains, we can simulate um, uh, injection molding flows and air flows through products. Um, so it's quite impressive what you can do but uh, it's always great to to never trust that 100%, you've got to kind of back that up with the, the physical as well. So that's when we get into the, the prototyping and that as well. So looking at tolerance stacks at this stage is um, so all the engineering rigor, making sure um, this thing can actually be manufactured with the current capabilities we have. And um, yeah, so this is going through the development phase, which, which is stages three to five in the process. Some examples of um, the level of detail the products are at at this phase. So we've got a couple of CAD uh, computer aided design renders on screen here and the detailed drawings that kind of go with it. And then the CH15 is an example. Um, how some inspiration kind of struck me on this one. So we were challenged on the filter to, to make this as thin as possible and at the start of the project, uh, the product had a, a filter lid which used a metal uh, component, which was great for getting the thinness, but it was quite challenging and costly to manufacture. So I looked at this in some detail and, and thought, how can we really achieve the same level of stiffness in, in the filter lid to, to apply compression on the um, granular media in the filter? And um, also not collapse under the vacuum packing pressure of the product. And it, it kind of struck me um, when looking at, at um, taking inspiration from, uh, I was one day popping some washing in my washing machine 
and noticed the surface uh, on the inside of the washing machine drum and it had this 3D structured kind of sheet metal and that struck me as a great opportunity to kind of build something like that into a plastic molded component as it it really kind of stiffens the the, the, the product um, so it's taking that same um, principle of like corrugated sheet metal but applying that in a three-dimensional way and um, that was really a great example of kind of outside inspiration so you're never really switching off as a designer you're always taking in inspiration from the world around you and uh, looking for opportunities to use that in, in new developments to make something new and innovative and in this case it allows us to to save an extra couple of millimeters on the, um, the filter design and um, kind of get it done in a, in a cost which was on budget as well so um, a, a good example of how how inspiration can strike and make its way through to a product and there it is in its finished form so on the surface you, you may just kind of see that undulating form of the filter lid and think um, it, it's just done for aesthetic reasons but um, there's a lot of kind of behind the scenes um, development and testing that goes into that so talking of testing and, and validation, this is a, a shot of our test laboratory we have on site and um, we have various equipment in here that we use to replicate the tests that um, our products get um, put through when they're certified to so either European or, or American standards or UK standards. And um, the largest piece of equipment we have um, is a total inward leakage chamber, which is something we use to test the fit of a respirator to a person and measure any leakage um, into the mask. But we can also do things like testing the field of view so, so we can really start to optimise uh, designs for visors and um, the forms of the masks to, to give a better vision. Um, we look at rebreathe CO2. Obviously, we need to keep that to a minimum, and the, there's requirements around that, so so people can can breathe effectively and um, and yeah, not suffer physiological effects. That, that would be bad. Um, we look at the breathing resistance. So again, always trying to minimise that. And um, flammability resistance is a is a great one because our products are yeah used in these very challenging environments. So we need to use. Um, very kind of hardened materials that can stand up to those um, situations. And as I mentioned, standards wise, we're typically working uh, with UK CA marking, uh, CE marking and NIOSH for the, the American market as well. Some examples of uh, various tests over the years. So practical performance where we, we kind of don the kit ourselves and uh, really kind of test out its operation and put it through its paces and and see how it's performing um, and we've got some great shots of flammability testing and flame engulfment there as well um, and also um, yeah the, the image on the bottom right is is myself in the total inward leakage chamber so measuring the protection factor that that um, escape respirator is providing there Onto the manufacturing phase, so this is all about how it's made and um, at our site, our factory site in, in Hampton Park West in Melksham in the UK, we have rubber moulding and assembly lines and so we, we've seen products kind of moulded and, and formed here and then, then brought to life on, on, yeah, on the assembly line and then we use a lot of third party suppliers to, to manufacture other components that we don't specialize in so things like plastic injection moldings and other ancillary parts and we we have to have a very strong link with um, between design and manufacture and that, that's real key to to ensuring that um, the process runs smoothly and we can actually get the product to, to market and produce it in the volumes required we'll do trial builds as well so really looking to iron out any problems before before the products launched so running through with operators and get, getting the training done um, and then through that we can start to refine the process and that doesn't really stop because we have a continuous improvements team who are, are tasked with working working through that with with all processes and really optimizing and improving those 
So yeah, that's occurring through the development phase and then also on into the launch. As I say, it, it doesn't really stop. It's a, a continuous endeavor. So some examples from manufacturing phase, we're, we're heavily working with tool makers and um, yeah, getting those tools into our factory so we can mold parts. And uh, it's, it's a very exciting phase for, for the designer where you physically see the finished product kind of come off the off the tooling and uh, those first few shots. It's always a, a very exciting time. And then finally, the, the launch phase. So this is a, a great time where you kind of see the, the fruit of the labor of um, yeah, all the hard work and you're releasing the product to your customers. Um, so here there's been yeah, great opportunities to, for the product development team to get involved in launch events where we kind of discuss the new products with our customers and uh, take part in promotions and things to, to really showcase the new capabilities. Um, and then it's really important to reflect on the lessons learned. So what's gone well? Um, what do we want to carry on doing? What, what could be done better? And really build that knowledge into future projects. And the launch is yeah, the final stage of the process, but you are kind of building that knowledge back into new projects. So if you think of it, it can just be a continuous kind of cyclic loop. And then examples here of um, products that are launched. So for me, it's a, it's a great um, moment of satisfaction when you're seeing the, the thing that you've spent um, often several years kind of working on kind of re released to the customers and getting to see them use it. And it's really enhancing their capabilities and um, and in some cases, yeah, um, helping to save lives. So that's really satisfying. And then back to CH15, so a bit of a journey there of, of how that has gone from concept to kind of final product. And it's, um, as I mentioned, it's it's always a, a continuous thing. We, we don't just kind of leave it there, we continue to develop. So we're now looking at new accessories to, to allow different carry modes. So we have a, a new molly mounting system for the CH15 and also a leg mounted holster. So that, that helps improve the, the carrying options we have for that product. So continuing to, to build and expand on those product lines as, as we go forward as well. OK, so that comes towards the end. I've got um, in summary, um, it, it is a journey. Every, every project is is really unique and you, it's a, a great chance to kind of learn new skills and, and really kind of hone and develop as, as you go through. But also, um, yeah, for the business, it's a, it's a journey as well as we expand our product portfolio. So the, the idea is often the easiest part. Um, I'm sure we're all aware of the, the quotes from Thomas Edison, 1% 1 1 inspiration, 99% perspiration. And I think that really does apply to product development. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of hard work that goes on behind the scenes, um, but that's often, yeah, not seen at the forefront. Um, yeah, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So. The types of product we're working on are, are very safety critical, so it, development times can be lengthy because of that. Um, and also, yeah, we, we we need to kind of ensure that that engineering rigor is there and, and the product will perform. So it, it can be a, a challenge and you've got to pace yourself as such, like in, in a marathon, um, but also during that long duration, kind of keep your eye on, on the goal of, of why you kind of set out on this journey and are you still staying on track to, to achieve that? Teamwork is the key, really. Um, there's no superheroes in, in product development. It's no, not down to one person. You need a great team around you and you need people bought into that, that vision and that idea. So that, that requires kind of great leadership as well. Um, so that, that's, that's really essential. And also requires tenacity. So. There will be times it gets very tough and um, yeah, compromise is 
is going to be a necessary thing along the way, but it's knowing when to compromise and when when you need to stand firm and you're not watering down the original concept and it's not turning into a, a design by committee. Um, so that that can be tough to navigate, but um, it, it does require tenacity to get through that. And then you've got to stay focused on the customer. Um, that's the really important part. So that's what's kind of inspired us to start on the journey at the start. So kind of keeping that in mind throughout the, the, the process and really as decisions are made, kind of trying to put yourself in the customer's shoes at each of those points to, to really ask, is this in the best interest of the customer? That, that will kind of help keep you on track and deliver something that is really required and, and will serve a, a great purpose for our customers. And yes, that's how we kind of arrived now at the CH15. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening and we'll now open up to any questions. Thanks, Nick. We do have quite a few questions already coming through, so I'll start at the top. How does Avon see far into the future for concepts of future products to solve customer needs? Yeah, so um, yeah, an interesting question because we've we've kind of made some um, developments in recent years. So we, I, I mentioned we have a, a futures team. So that's a, a very new kind of um, development in the last few years. They're based in in the Baltimore site, um, and they're specifically focused on that that um, kind of future kind of product roadmap and looking those kind of 5, 10, 15 years out into the future. And, and we work very closely with them. So um, as, as we're out and we see kind of new things and new inspiration comes to us, we kind of feed that back in. Um, and, and it's really kind of a, a strategic um, direction that's formed through that team. Um, and that's perhaps one to look out for. I believe there's a, a webinar coming in in the following months from uh, uh, Clint Mayhew's Heads Up the Futures team. Thank you. Um, another question, what is the most challenging part of the process? Um, yeah, so I, I think it is that that kind of that determination, that, that tenacity, keeping that drive and, and passion kind of throughout the project is, is something that um, you need to do and, and because of the development time um, yeah, I'd say two years is is typically a, a fast project. Um, CH15 was kind of yeah, that ran for for about five years so kind of keeping that drive and passion going and um, yeah that, that's that's really something that you, you have to be able to try and do and some there will be points where you kind of feel down and things aren't going right but then you get real, real kind of high moments and that kind of spurs you on and and um, just get into the finish line when you, you kind of feel that satisfaction of seeing the product in, in the hands of the customer. That's really what keeps me driving through the process. That's kind of my motivation. Thank you. Um, as the primary consideration with these products is their function and performance, how much scope is there to be creative with the product design? Yeah, so um, we, we generally kind of, yeah, we, with respirators, we're working around the, the human body um, and we're often using, yeah, uh, technology that's been developed many years ago and is, is incrementally advancing. So we do have those products which are kind of the incremental advances. Um, but there's always the opportunities, technology is always pushing on. And as we saw with the, with the, the power there, um, kind of getting into that, that was something kind of totally new. Um, but there's, there's always chances to kind of build in and that will really change the, the future of the products. And, and um, obviously can't go into it, but there's exciting new things that we're looking at for the future. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I, I like to be creative and I do manage to kind of yeah, use that creativity to affect, I think, in my work here. So it's it's not just all um yeah kind of using um basics and uh you you, ha you have chance to use a bit of design flair and creativity as well great uh, question how long on um sorry how long does it take to develop a product on average yeah so i mentioned yeah i'd say two years is is a, a quick development so that that's thinking from a new product if, if it's something we're looking to 
uh, maybe build a an enhancement to a new product that that can be quicker so perhaps into a year there or less but for a, for a new uh, a kind of new product um, so ch15 in the example is a development on from from our nh15 but it's a totally new kind of architecture you're not using any of the components from the nh15 so it's almost a a rethink from scratch and that that development was was a five-year kind of journey another question here do you see your role as solely meeting customer needs or anticipating future capability yeah that's a good one so um yeah i think um definitely a, a bit of both we we have had um there's, there's instances where customers know exactly what they want and they come to us with pretty much a specification saying can you can you make this for us um and that's quite um quite well quite good because it's well defined and you you can kind of put a plan around that and, and execute on it um but there are definitely times and examples where we we kind of know that um, an opportunity exists that maybe our customers don't see yet and that's where we have to put things together so maybe we build an initial prototype or or maybe it's just some some sketches that we can start a discussion with our customers and and then start to really find if if this is something that they perhaps would buy into um, but, but that that could be something that kind of challenges the norm and is, is a bit of a different uh, product than than what's exi is existing in the market Great. Um, this person asked, what is your approach to proving purchase during phase three? Yeah, so that, that's a, a real kind of collaboration with the product management team. So they do a lot of research um, and work closely with the customers in terms of, of looking at um, budgets and purchase cycles and and looking at tr uh, tracking kind of previous sales on on our product lines as well to identify opportunities so yeah it's it's a it's a kind of business um intelligence gathering kind of opportunity so we we have to collaborate with them and um show what we can produce and then they they interface with the customer and, and gather that information to to show that there is a a viable case to to manufacture this product Okay, what type of 3D printers do you have and why? Okay, yes, um, we we have expanded over over the last three years or so. So we started off with um, a polyjet machine and this was great for real, real high quality detail prints, um, but it's quite costly to run and um, has limits to the build volume. So that that still runs today. It's a, a great piece of kit, but we we use it when we um, perhaps need to cast um, other components. So we we have created some low volume tooling for prototype parts with that, and also yeah, higher fidelity detail. But then we also use um, FDM printers where we need something perhaps a bit quicker and cheaper, and um, yeah, that that's that's great for kind of printing stuff in materials that is fairly close to some of the plastics that we use as well um, and then we've we've expanded our kind of line of resin uh, printers more recently as well because they're they're good in we've we've got a whole range of materials that are on offer so we can do different um, we can even do flexible materials there to simulate uh, rubbers um, but also things like high temperature resins if we're looking at fire hardened materials as well Okay, a uh, question here, what sets Stephen apart from the competition? Yeah, I think um, I think it really is that, that kind of the whole team um, is, is, is a really important thing and, and the culture that's that's in the company. Um, and we really see it, we, we kind of have, everyone has real great pride in, in what they produce. Um, there's a collective sense that um, a product is is made by everyone i think at the company it's not just down to one person everyone has their own little part to play and um it's great when we yeah kind of get to speak to the users and and they have this real confidence when they see an avon product and and they know they're they're, they're confident it will kind of meet their needs great another question here do you develop all products strictly in-house 
Do you ever look to small startups for new innovations? Yeah, great. Um, so we do have an in-house team. Obviously, I mentioned we, we got over 15. Um, but yeah, there are times where we need to um, expand and bring on extra resource due to different project workloads. So yeah, we've worked with external design consultancies before to really um, add, add an extra kind of, um, yeah, expertise and um, extra kind of resource to our team when, when required. Lovely. Uh, another question here. Many of your products seem to have a certain aesthetic, partly a product of their function, but beyond that, what is your aspiration for the way your products look? A few yeah. adjectives would be great. <laughs> Yeah, so we we call this um, a visual brand language, and um, it's something that's that's perhaps evolved. Uh, and I'd say up until probably the last kind of five years or so, it, it's something that we've we've not kind of tracked perhaps as as well as we do now. But we we definitely look to have um, a strong visual appearance, but but it's not a, overly aggressive. Um, we like to be, yeah, it's it's kind of like a stern, um, like authoritative uh, look to our products rather than aggressive. Um, but it's got to meet the market as well. So uh, military um, demands a certain look and uh, law enforcement, maybe it, it differs slightly less. Uh, it changes again. And then industrial applications, they want um, a slightly different look. So we, we have to tailor that to the customer really. Um, but we we do pay attention to that, and it's something that we we look to build into our our designs. Lovely. So I think stern is probably the adjective I've taken away from that. Um, we don't have many. Oh, sorry, just another one's coming through now. Uh, here we go. If you weren't designing protection equipment, what would you like to design? <laughs> um, wow. Yeah. So I I kind of. Um, I got into design. I was first inspired to kind of go that career path um, because I discovered car design, and uh, that was kind of during like high school. Um, so when I was looking at careers, but then discovered industrial design, and it was just that realization of everything, every manufactured object around has been designed by a team and and, and developed and and got to production. Um, so that's where I discovered industrial design. Um, and since graduating, yeah, I've, I've kind of gone through, I've, I've done products for um, the, the kind of, yeah, more more furniture based. And then um, I went to a company that I did bathrooms and bathroom kind of um, furniture and fittings. So it was a, a totally different career jump to come to Avon Protection. Um, but it, it was fascinating for me because I, I wanted to get more into the hands on um, product development and uh, working closely with a factory and uh, yeah, really that that kind of test development and and learning from that. So, yeah, I think um, I think protection is is a is a great category. Um, always kind of getting more into the the products with um, electronics and and user interface is is quite a an interesting one. And I think as as the future of as the future continues, we'll see those kind of aspects start to come into perhaps our products. So that's um, yeah something that interests me, I think, as well. Lovely, thank you. Nick. As it stands, we haven't got any further questions, but if we just wait a minute or two, see if any more come through. But um, thank you very much for your presentation. I personally found it interesting, so hopefully our audience did as well. If you guys do have any questions, um, please pop in the question box here. If not, we will be sending a recording of this webinar out to everyone who registered, so you will be able to listen back on demand. Yeah, I think we'll leave it there. Well, thank you very yeah, much, Nick. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.